For Americans who grew up in the 1990s and 2000s, the childhood highlight was a local shopping mall. Every busy mall shared the essential sights and sounds. The Build-A-Bear workshop with massive lines during the holidays, the warm, buttery scent of Cinnabon, the cool Apple store, the intimidating mannequins of Victoria's Secret that scared away even the most curious of teenagers, the fluorescent yellow lights radiating from Mrs. Fields, the punk emo vibes of Hot Topic, and most of all, the quintessential Abercrombie store. No pilgrimage to the mall was complete without Abercrombie. Back then, Abercrombie was the brand of choice for teens and young adults. For girls, it was the long torso skinny t-shirts, the impractically thin long sleeves, the ripped jeans, denim jackets, neon sweatpants, and for dudes it was the polos, graphic tees, hoodies, sweats, and cargo shorts. Just about every item was embroidered or printed with massive logos placed in the most conspicuous areas possible. You couldn't miss when someone was wearing Abercrombie. Abercrombie had an aspirational vibe that no other mainstream clothing brand evoked at the time. Abercrombie was cool and preppy. Back then, fashion was underdeveloped. Malls were the exclusive channel, and trends were set by the few mainstream brands who had the capital, presence, and scale. Before e-commerce and social media, consumers were limited to the stores that were physically around them. Whatever brands were in the local mall, and whatever items hanging on the store rack, was what ended up making up one's wardrobe. As a result, consumers then were conformist, and they sought availability and brands over quality and fit. In this era of limited options and looks, Abercrombie was cool and safe. They had stores everywhere, and even if the design was loud, as long as you were wearing Abercrombie, you were fitting in. While wearing Abercrombie was a statement, going into Abercrombie was an adventure. To the impressionable adolescent just trying to fit in, Abercrombie stores were uniquely intimidating and alluring. The dim lighting that extended from the entrance all the way into the fitting rooms that made it hard to actually see what the clothes looked like, the pungent, musky cologne pumped into the ventilation system, the blaring music that pounded from speakers at every corner of every room, the floor-to-ceiling wallpapers of sculpted men in central poses, and fit staff in flip-flops. Going into an Abercrombie store was like a juvenile fantasy. The dark, loud, choking, and provocative atmosphere was the closest that teenagers could get to experiencing a nightclub, a college party, or some comparably exclusive event for only cool kids. From the 80s to 2000s, Abercrombie was the prom king of American fashion. Yet as the shopping mall died, e-commerce grew to expand access, social media helped widen consumer perspectives and styles, and competition intensified with fast fashion players like Uniqlo, Zara, H&M, Forever 21, and athleisure brands like Lululemon and Nike entering the scene. In less than a decade, Abercrombie went out of style. Consumers were now more individualistic and no longer cared for the company's loud clothing, pretentious branding, repetitive styles, poor quality, and high prices. Past comments from Abercrombie's CEO about the brand's elitism surfaced and spread like wildfire on social and mainstream media. In response, the CEO was deposed swiftly, but the damage had already been done in the mind of millions. The controversial statements only reinforced the perception of Abercrombie as an outdated, exclusionary, over-sexualized brand built on teenage angst. The full-blown PR crisis, widespread disapproval, and declining consumer popularity had many predicting this to be the death of Abercrombie. Yet instead of succumbing to what would be a fatal strike for any company, Abercrombie has reinvented itself to record success in just five years, reaching levels of income and profits that the company has not experienced since 2012. On social media, brand excitement is more visible than ever, with organic endorsements from millennials and Zoomers sharing their latest hauls and outfits from Abercrombie. In this episode, we'll break down the business mistakes that led to Abercrombie's initial downfall and cover the winning strategy that has made Abercrombie cool once again. Pivoting from a mall retailer and into an omni-channel clothing brand with integrated online and offline shopping has put Abercrombie on a path to success with higher margins than ever before. Shopify is a leader in omni-channel commerce and the sponsor of this episode. Shopify is a commerce platform that's easy to use and offers anyone the ability to start, grow, and manage a business. Shopify helps companies scale from first sale to full scale and allows anyone to sell online, through major social platforms and in person. If you're a brick and mortar store, you can use Shopify's point of sale system to manage everything from inventory management to reporting. With e-commerce and point of sale systems under one umbrella with Shopify, 
You serve customers as one no matter where or when they shop. Customers get a unified shopping experience across online and offline properties. And as a business owner, you can consolidate channels, manage sales, and convert customers on any device and venue. Shopify powers more entrepreneurs than anyone else in the world with millions of businesses in 175 countries. And as a company, Shopify believes in a future where commerce has more voices and they're reducing the barriers to business ownership to make commerce better for everyone. Start your business today with a free trial of Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash modern MBA to learn more. Thank you to Shopify for supporting Modern MBA and making this episode possible. Before we dive into Abercrombie, we have to take a few steps back to understand a few core concepts that are central to the business of fashion. Just like how finance is built on information arbitrage, fashion is built on arbitrage between factories and clothing brands. Factories produce clothing based on specifications and design that are submitted by brands, and the cost of clothing is a function of the materials that are used, the ease of production, and the volume ordered. The difference between clothing retailers and general retailers is that clothing retailers are the ones who design and brand the products, whereas general retailers think Target, Walmart, convenience stores, supermarkets, gas stations, and discount shops. They buy finished, individually packaged goods at wholesale prices from multiple brands and resell them to the public at a markup. In general retail, the arbitrage is between the wholesale cost and the retail price. In clothing, the wholesale cost is dynamic as the brand is the one who sets the design, specs, material, all of which influence cost with predetermined retail price ranges in mind. The brand must also forecast demand, which determines the final quantity ordered and the final wholesale cost. Fashion brands like Abercrombie carry a wide variety of items for sale at various price points. Fragrance, shoes, tops, bottoms, underwear, pajamas, swimwears, and outerwear. When each clothing category has its own costs and price ranges, companies rely on higher level abstractions to better comprehend their margins. AUC, or average unit cost, is the average amount paid to factories for each unit of clothing. AUR is average unit retail, the average amount paid by customers for each unit of clothing. The delta between AUR and AUC is the gross profit. Fashion brands apply an initial markup on AUC to determine AUR. Markups are rarely, if ever, adjusted upwards, which means that fashion brands have one chance to get the price right for every piece of clothing that they bring to market. Once the retail price is set, it can only ever go down. In the world of fashion, brands must walk the tightrope of balancing profits and volume. If they set too high of a price, they can lock in profits, but will end up with less volume sold and potentially excess inventory. If they set too low of a price, the profits are slim, but higher sales volume and lower leftover inventory is better insured. The reason why inventory management, demand planning, and pricing is so critical for fashion businesses is due to the fundamentally short lifespan of clothes. For non-clothing CPGs like candy, toilet paper, or phone chargers, not selling at expectations just means carrying it for longer on the store shelves or putting it back into storage until demand picks back up. The challenge with fashion is that trends change quickly and every customer wants fresh, new, hot, in-season, in-fashion items. Brands must constantly clear their inventory to make room for the latest style. So the t-shirt that isn't selling now won't sell any better with more time and is too costly to keep taking up valuable space on the store shelves and in storage. Due to carrying costs, the absence of appreciation, the high perishability, and the fundamentally short sales window, Fashion brands must rely on markdowns to keep inventory flowing out. Slashing the retail price or decreasing the initial markup on clearance or end of season items are all ways in which fashion brands clear out their inventory. The biggest markdowns or discounts can always be found on final sale items that are sold as is with no refunds or exchanges allowed. In these scenarios, the brand just wants to get rid of that product without having to throw it in the trash. Fashion is a business about precision. The goal is to design and sell clothes that can be sold at the highest initial markup to maximize profits while also generating enough demand that you have little to no inventory left over. In an ideal world, every article of clothing is designed and priced so perfectly that it all sells out, every style and every size, so no markdown is ever necessary. This is what Abercrombie in its heyday was so successful at. It had engineered demand and built up appeal so strong that the company could set high prices and sell massive volumes of apparel worldwide through its name alone. 
design and material were a lot less important. So Abercrombie through the 90s and 2000s was a trendsetter. Generating demand and engineering exclusivity was Mike Jeffries, the infamous former CEO of Abercrombie's greatest contribution to the company. When he took over Abercrombie in the 70s, the brand was lifeless. In 14 years, Mike had transformed Abercrombie into, quote, the essence of privilege and luxury as an all-American brand with Ivy League heritage that projected beauty in the form of white college hunks surrounded by attractive, thin white women. Abercrombie was something that people at the time had never experienced before, an aesthetic that was more provocative and aspirational than the conventional, old-fashioned, family-friendly brands like Sears or Old Navy or Gap, and these were all reinforced in the store displays, atmosphere, packaging, and advertising. What is amusing is that when we revisit such imagery today, there's more skin than clothes. When the clothes do make it into the shot, they're often barely in frame. The only things in focus are the model's toned abs, massive shoulders, and chiseled jawline. Boys wanted to be like the Abercrombie models, and girls wanted to be with him. Interestingly enough, women have made up over 60% of Abercrombie's business since the 90s, a trend that continues to this present day. Mike's second greatest contribution was channeling that same appeal and demand into a more focused brand made just for teenagers in 2001 called Hollister. Hollister was another all-American brand featuring hot lifeguards and beautiful beaches and captured the fantasy of Southern California. While Abercrombie & Fitch was the leading aspirational brand for college-age adults, Hollister would become the leading aspirational brand for high school guys and gals. Hollister would go from $0 in 2000 to gross over a billion dollars in just four years in 2005 and would eventually surpass even Abercrombie by hundreds of millions in annual sales, a trend that continues to this day. Hollister would grow to over twice the scale of Abercrombie, from just five stores to over 500 stores present day. Beyond a difference in the decor and logos, a moose versus a seagull, the two brands were largely interchangeable. While Mike's idea was that the high school kids would graduate from shopping at Hollister to shopping at Abercrombie when they reached college, the reality is that the average customer rarely understood the difference between the two brands. The trademark dim lighting, stuffy air, loud branding, pounding music, styles, products, and even the store layout of Abercrombie was replicated at Hollister. At malls, Hollister and Abercrombie stores were often next to each other or located in very close proximity leading customers to naturally stop and shop at both brands. Mike's sole strategy was to optimize the top line at the expense of the bottom line and even long-term growth. Abercrombie's revenue grew from $1.3 billion in 2001 to over $4 billion in 2014, which was his last full year at the helm. Quadrupling revenue is no small feat, especially as competition had intensified from fast fashion heavyweights like Uniqlo, H&M, and Zara. But Mike intentionally ignored the obvious signals of declining customer retention. Same store sales, which measure the sales at locations that have been in operation for at least one year, were consistently ugly. Positive same store sales were the exception at Abercrombie, not the norm. In the 14 year period from 2001 to 2014, Abercrombie had only enjoyed positive same store sales in five of those years. The other nine years were in the red. To offset declining customer retention, Mike's playbook was to keep expanding. He was operating at a time in retail where presence mattered more than product. Opening up hundreds of new stores every year would provide a short-term sales injection big enough to offset declining sales at existing stores. So Mike did this every year, year after year, until Abercrombie was materially overbuilt, malls were oversaturated, and new locations no longer brought in any new customers and sales boosts. Between 2001 and 2013, Abercrombie grew from 491 stores to over 1,000 locations. The company went from 3.6 million square feet of stores to nearly 8 million. When we look at the store productivity, measured in how many sales were generated per square foot, one can trace the diminishing returns of Abercrombie's relentless expansion. Because of how integral Mike deemed the store experience to be in reinforcing the brand's appeal, Abercrombie stores were big. They came in on average over 8,000 square feet. That's larger than Banana Republic, Victoria's Secret, Lululemon, or even American Eagles stores. Fast fashion brands like Uniqlo, H&M, Zara, and Forever 21, for comparison, generally feature larger stores that sit on average between 10,000 to 20,000 square feet with multiple floors. 
While Abercrombie wanted to be in every mall and in every town, its competition preferred slower expansion and having one or two flagship stores that serviced many neighborhoods, knowing that its customers were willing to travel for low prices and new styles which were unique to fast fashion. Mike made no attempt to hide Abercrombie's relentless expansion and its consequences. The overexpansion year over year boosted sales temporarily and offset the declining retention. The greater scale caused issues with inventory, supply chain, and impacted margins. When Abercrombie was peaking in the early 2000s, the company set higher initial markups with the confidence that the consumers were willing to pay more to wear its clothes. This led to a material improvement in gross margins year over year from 2001 to 2007 as the company enjoyed higher AUR to AUC. But just like when we looked at the sales productivity, there's a similar inflection in gross margins. The clear peak and valley is like a quantified rise and fall of Abercrombie's brand power. The increased overhead costs of opening and operating 100 plus net new stores every year chewed into those gross profits. When we look at the operating margin in relation to gross margin, it's clear that the increased overhead costs were temporarily offset by the improvements in AUR and initial markups, the same way that declining customer retention was offset by the temporary sales growth. Under Mike, Abercrombie spent $100 to $200 million every year on opening up new stores, which in most years was the same amount that the company was taking home as net income. The company used the cash from revenue to fund its expansion. The problem that Abercrombie had was not just the rate of expansion, but also the type of expansion. Mike had always positioned Abercrombie as a casual luxury brand for the masses, and as the company did well, it only added to his temptation to continue pushing the brand higher up towards true luxury. Taking a page out of high fashion, Mike wanted Abercrombie to have the same physical, awe-inspiring presence of a luxury retailer like Gucci or Prada. The distinction in Mike's head was that Abercrombie would be a uniquely all-American luxury brand, whereas most high fashion to this day remains European. Under Mike, Abercrombie opened up massive 20,000 square foot, meticulously designed flagship stores that carried exclusive merchandise in expensive, tourist-heavy, wealthy, high-traffic areas like the Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and the Grove in Los Angeles. He expected these stores to not only generate sales higher than the standard locations, but also to further reinforce Abercrombie as American luxury. When Abercrombie's expansion in the United States hit diminishing returns, he pursued expansion overseas, building and opening massive flagship stores in London, Milan, Tokyo, Copenhagen, Paris, Madrid, Australia, Dubai, Shanghai, Munich, Amsterdam, and Brussels. Abercrombie flagships even popped up in Japan's sixth largest city, Ireland, and Soho, even when there was already a flagship location on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Mike believed that the flagship model was a low-risk, high-return in optics and fundamentals, and he knew no restraint. In his mind, every corner of the world was ripe for Abercrombie, and everything that sold in the U.S. would magically sell as-is overseas. These flagship stores not only cost millions to build and operate, but also resulted in millions in losses when they were eventually shut down due to lack of adequate business. Mike continued to embrace the luxury play, even when the business and customers were clearly indicating that the brand was in no way ready for such a leap. In an effort to replicate the Fifth Avenue and Soho flagship store experience, he invested millions more to remodel existing Abercrombie locations in the U.S. to bring that sense of luxury to the masses. This strategy may have worked if Abercrombie was competing on quality, but had really built up its reputation over the years on branding. Mike should have known this better than anyone. Abercrombie also eliminated the conventional seasonal sales events like the post-summer and post-holiday markdowns that were the norm for clothing retailers in order to further reinforce his luxury positioning. He wanted full-price merchandise at all times, less styles, to run fewer promotions to maintain the AUR, to reduce the availability and eventually the existence of markdowns, and to carry even more inventory to ensure that the hottest sizes and colors were always in stock, even if that meant higher carrying costs. Abercrombie's direction with Mike at the helm from 2001 to 2013 went against all the trends that were emerging in fashion. It was difficult to justify buying $100 button-downs, $60 polos, $300 fake fur jackets, and $80 jeans from Abercrombie when Uniqlo, Zara, and H&M, and other fast fashion brands were offering comparable quality 
and more styles at one half or one third the cost. Abercrombie styles were consistent and predictable. You never worried about not finding something in your size at Abercrombie when it was on sale at full price. Fast fashion brands, in comparison, frequently refresh their styles to keep things engaging, but you have to move fast to secure a size or a certain color with the smaller quantities. Mike's greatest mistake was not accepting that fashion and retail was changing. While the market was going lower, cheaper, faster, broader, and leaner, Mike was pulling Abercrombie to be higher, slower, bigger, and more narrow. It was impossible for him to imagine a world where customers would not conform to one or two brands, that stores would become non-essential, that malls would soon have little power, and that fashion itself would grow big enough to sustain hundreds of companies. While Mike Jeffries is remembered most for his controversial comments, it was really his failure to adapt to the times and his flawed growth strategy that ultimately cost him his job. His mistakes reduced Abercrombie's operating margins from double digits to single digits and net income to one third to what it was making over a decade ago. Fran Horowitz, a female executive who had lived through the same changes in fashion working at Bloomingdale's for over a decade, took over as the new CEO of Abercrombie in 2014. Investors expected Fran to be nothing more than a caretaker and had little expectations of the company turning things around. Abercrombie was predicted by many to be the next big retailer to die. Yet under Fran, Abercrombie has roared back to new life and reinvented itself from the provocative, outdated, out-of-fashion, cool white kids-only brand to the logoless, in-fashion, affordable, sell-out core staple of millennials and Zoomers everywhere. Fran's first move as CEO was to reshape the organization. Under the former CEO, Abercrombie's org chart resembled that of a totalitarian state where Mike Jeffries presided over with a watchful eye over every corner of his empire from clothing and operations to store and design. He infamously banned the sale of black-colored clothing, believing black to be only appropriate for tuxedos. With a personal vendetta against overweight women, Mike refused to sell plus-size clothing and he restricted women's pants to a size 10 at the highest. But on the other hand, he had no problem selling Abercrombie to obese men. Fran threw out this dictatorship model in favor of a flat, modern org structure with Hollister and Abercrombie as two separate primary business units with clearly designated leaders. If Abercrombie was to be saved, it had to start competing on quality. It could not compete on price and speed, which is where fast fashion held the advantage. Abercrombie was repositioned from the essence of privilege and luxury and Ivy League heritage rooted in East Coast traditions into effortless American style rooted in quality craftsmanship with a focus on modern classics. Hollister changed from leading with hot lifeguards to laid back, effortlessly cool, and totally accessible. Abercrombie targeted young millennials and Hollister continued to target teens. But changing consumer perception requires way more work than revising marketing boilerplate. If anything, this change was likely more effective internally as it gave the new teams at the company a clear North Star and aesthetic to chase after while wiping the slate clean of its troubled past. When Fran took over in 2014, it would have been tempting to just shut down all the Abercrombie stores in a brainless exercise of cost-benefit analysis and to turn the company into a lean entity ripe for acquisition. But even though the company was struggling and retail was trending downwards, Fran was wise to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. The underperforming, oversized 8,000 square foot locations were the first to go. Under Fran, the number of Abercrombie stores declined roughly 30% from over 1,000 stores in 2014 to a little over 700 locations in 2021. Presence declined by roughly 30% from nearly 8 million square feet in 2012 to a little over 5 million square feet in 2021. The money burning flagship behemoths were the next to go, with proactive closures in Ireland. Copenhagen, Soho, Milan, Japan, and London. These closures reduced annual occupancy costs by $200 to $250 million every year, which Fran has reinvested back into Abercrombie's e-commerce, operations, and product development. Rather than simply remove stores, Fran has opted to right-size and redefine. The strategy has been to evolve from the large, grander-than-life stores of 8,000 square feet into smaller, more efficient omni-channel hubs of 4,500 square feet. While the former CEO, tech, media, and even Wall Street have long heralded e-commerce and retail as mutually exclusive channels, Fran sees the two as complementary. 
While digital makes up over half of Abercrombie's business today, the company believes that customers ultimately benefit most from a shopping experience that blends online and offline together versus treating them as two channels that exist separately from each other. Today, customers have many options when they buy from Abercrombie. They can make purchases online and pick up their order in store. They can reserve items online to try on at the store before buying. They can ship in-store merchandise to their home, or they can return the items that are purchased online at any store or vice versa. When a customer comes into an Abercrombie store to pick up an order, try on an outfit, or return an item, the company believes that having a store creates the opportunities for organic retention, cross-sell and upsell in ways that a website never can. While this functionality might seem like the standard today, the amount of investment required to support such an integration between online and offline is no small feat. Not every retailer today is able to offer such a precise shopping experience. High fashion brands like Prada or Gucci, who operate at significantly smaller scale, fewer stores, and carry much fewer products, do not offer such back-end capabilities even to its own staff. The biggest bottleneck to the strategy has been the landlords. While Mike Jeffries was opening up Abercrombie stores left and right, he was happy to sign long-term leases with landlords all over the world. These same landlords now have little incentive to partner with Abercrombie to downsize those locations into smaller spaces. If Abercrombie wishes to break their leases before expiration, these same landlords are demanding a payout for early termination. In some cases, it's cheaper for Abercrombie to simply not operate the store and continue paying rent every month for unused space than it is to settle with the landlord. Fran reinvented the stores in all aspects, lighting, imagery, packaging, decor, storefront, and music. While past Abercrombie stores were dark and moody, the new ones are bright, well-lit, and designed to be open and inviting. The half-nude white muscular male has been replaced with fully clothed, ordinary-looking, relatable millennials of all ethnicities and genders. Yet the company acknowledges that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Since Abercrombie is targeted towards millennials, the company understands that millennials are busy. They work long hours, they generally have multiple jobs, and they're dealing with adulthood and post-grad life. Abercrombie stores these days are designed to have clear and open sight lines so millennials can quickly find what they're looking for when they step inside. Millennials are efficient, always on the move, and don't need so many physical stores. But in comparison, Hollister is targeted towards Zoomers who regard the mall as a valuable social activity. As a result, Hollister stores have not experienced the same consolidation in space and count as Abercrombie stores over the years. Brightening the storefront and interior, not downsizing or right-sizing, is a priority for Hollister to keep their experience engaging for Gen Z. But improving the venue and org structure alone would not have been enough without changing the product. Fran set Abercrombie's focus to be on following fashion, Rather than gutting everything and following fast fashion in a race to the bottom using cheap synthetic materials, the company's goal was to compete on quality and to be agile enough to capitalize on trends. When high rise and straight jeans became hot, Abercrombie moved quickly to update its denim offerings across both brands and genders. When oversized, soft, cozy, baggy, and casual became fashionable, the company responded with larger sweatshirts and sweatpants for men and fleece tops and knit bottoms for women. And now that neutrals, non-branded logo-free basics are in, you would be hard-pressed to find any piece of clothing from Abercrombie these days that is as loud in branding or color as it was a decade ago. Under Mike, Abercrombie operated under a make-to-stock strategy of literally producing enough of each item to stock the 1,000-plus Abercrombie and Hollister stores worldwide. This only worked when the brand was so dominant that most everything sold, regardless of design and material. Under Fran today, Abercrombie operates under a lean chase strategy, where production is set to match demand with the goal of carrying little to no leftover inventory. Product is made and stocked at low quantities to reduce risk. If demand exceeds supply, then production will reactively chase that demand. To accomplish this, Fran has expanded Abercrombie's manufacturing capacity across Southeast Asia, they've reduced product development by four weeks, and they've lowered production exposure to China by 50% since 2014. Items from Abercrombie these days regularly sell out, are not restocked, and are generally made in Vietnam. Inventory nowadays is sourced and purchased and reviewed internally every week, and no longer once a quarter. The last magic ingredient behind Abercrombie's turnaround has been the organic advocacy online from its customers. Millennials and Zoomers, both male and female, 
go to great lengths to pound the table for the brand on TikTok and Instagram, evangelizing the latest new products, hot finds, discounts, hauls, and more outfits to millions online. While Fran has named this phenomenon social selling, the term comes off as a little misleading and doesn't feel quite accurate. Since Abercrombie fell out of fashion years ago, no amount of paid marketing could ever convince people that the brand had changed for the better. Like many, I stood in the anti-Abercrombie camp and had sought refuge in conservative, safe, business casual, and fast fashion brands. But going through social media, seeing the actual outfits, products, and hauls on TikTok, and hearing the authentic, genuine, non-sponsored endorsement from peers on my feed about Abercrombie got me intrigued. Fast forward a year and my neutral and black Abercrombie puffer jackets are core essentials in my wardrobe, they've kept me warm through many winters, and the quality for price paid has put the thought of one day upgrading to Canada Goose or Montclair far out of my head. And when people ask me where my jackets are from, their first guess is that it's from some limited run posh collection like Fear of God and not Abercrombie. Since I haven't stepped foot into a mall with the time or intent to explore in years, Abercrombie's store remodels and repositioning would have been lost on me. It was only through social media and the organic, authentic evangelism from peers that have changed my mind on Abercrombie. Under Fran, Abercrombie has become cool again and surged to new success with record net income, operating margins, and top line that has not been seen in over a decade. 2023 marks the ninth year of Fran's tenure at Abercrombie. In nine years, Abercrombie under Fran has changed its reputation in the eyes of the most critical, connected, and informed generation of millennials. While Abercrombie will never reach the same heights as it did during its heyday as the dominant trendsetter, the reality is that no one company ever will in fashion. Markets change rapidly, and the consequences are brutal for those that resist change. Abercrombie is a timeless story that reinforces that contrary to what people see today, business is not about spectacle and headlines. The hardest part about anything is doing the work, and business is about continuous progress and product. When you invest in both consistently, thoroughly, and diligently, any company can be successful, even one as forgotten and out of fashion as Abercrombie.